Welcome back to Genetics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about the specifics of oogenesis, which is the process by which women, or just females in general, manufacture what's called an ovum, which is what we typically, in common talk, refer to as the egg. Okay. In a separate video, we'll talk about spermatogenesis, which obviously occurs in males, but that is a far simpler process. Oogenesis is much more complicated. Now, as I mentioned in the spermatogenesis video, I said that pretty much spermatogenesis is just meiosis. It's just the form of meiosis that occurs in males. Oogenesis is just meiosis. It's just the form of meiosis that occurs in females. All right, so before birth, we start off with an oogonium, which is a type of stem cell that is diploid. And I also have this diagram over here on the left side to help you keep track of the ploidy of really each stage. The oogonium is represented by this up at the top. Um, this one red line here represents one set of chromosomes, 1 through 23, and this blue one represents the homologous set, um, which is a unique set from the red set. So the oogonium is diploid. All right. Now, what's going to happen before birth is uh, this oogonium, first of all, is going to, as we know, it's going to replicate. You're going to have a whole bunch of these oogoniums. I think the number that uh, women will ultimately have is around 40,000, although I could be wrong in their lifetime. Now, before birth, also, these oogoniums are going to grow. And we hopefully know that growth is going to occur in interphase of the cell cycle. In interphase, if we want to prepare for mitosis to eventually divide, or in this case, meiosis, we have to go through G1, the S phase, and G2 of the cell cycle. G1 and G2 are really just growth phases, but the S phase is really important to think about here. The S phase is where the DNA gets replicated, all right, and that's going to ultimately occur going into infancy and childhood, which is where we start meiosis one. Okay, we're going to start it, but we're not going to complete it. In fact, we're not going to get very far in meiosis one either. All right, so in S phase prior to that, this DNA is going to get replicated. So instead of one set of the red chromosomes, we're going to have two sets of the red chromosomes. And instead of one set of the blue chromosome, we're going to have two sets of the blue chromosome. And you might look at this and say there's four chromosomes. That has to be tetraploid, right? Well, the answer is no. This is still diploid, even though the DNA has been doubled or replicated. Um, and there's a really helpful way to think about this that I don't think is taught too much. You really have to ask yourself, how many unique chromosomes are there? How many unique chromosomes? Well, if we look up here where we have the oogonium, there's two unique chromosomes, right? The red one and the blue one, right? If we look down here, the reason this is not tetraploid and it's still diploid, 2n, is because there's still two unique chromosomes. The red ones are not different from each other. They're just, that's a unique chromosome. They're, they're separate DNA molecules, but they're identical, okay, because we just replicated the DNA. These are identical. So it's not four unique DNA molecules. It's, there's only two unique DNA molecules here. There's just two of them. So there's only two unique DNA molecules there, so it's still 2N. And what's initially going to happen is we're going to start meiosis 1. Remember, meiosis has two stages, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. And the stages are named according to mitosis. There's prophase 1, metaphase 1, anaphase 1, and telophase 1. And the same thing goes for meiosis 2, except all of them become pro prophase 2 and so on and so forth. But in infancy and childhood, we start meiosis 1, but we only get through the first stage, and we don't even get all the way through it. We have what's called a primary oocyte that gets arrested in prophase 1. Arrested just means it gets halted, it gets stopped. Okay, It's kind of like being in a traffic jam. You're stuck there, and this primary oocyte is arrested in prophase 1. And this is actually what we see at, the, at birth. Okay. Now, and it stays this way for a long period of time, arrested in prophase 1. And it stays this way pretty much through childhood until you hit puberty. And that's when all hell breaks loose in this whole process and it gets really complicated. So now, once you hit puberty, this primary oocyte will now continue meiosis 1. And it will essentially finish prophase 1 and it will undergo the rest of meiosis, my metaphase 1, telophase, or anaphase 1, telophase 1. And remember, after telophase 1, we actually have the cytokinesis, which we might even call cytokinesis 1, although I don't think it's called that. And what happens is the 
primary oocyte splits. But you'll notice something here. First of all, when it splits, the two resulting cells are very different sizes. Okay? One of them, which is the big one, is called the secondary oocyte. We'll come back to that in a minute. And the small one's called a polar body. And in general, because this is the first one that's produced, it's called the first polar body. Now, one of the things that's really important to consider in oogenesis in making eggs in females is that that infant is going to be ultimately developed from this ovum. And so a lot of nutrients and things, proteins, mRNAs, all sorts of stuff has to be present in this ovum. A lot of it so that it can get the developmental program going and so you can get an infant ultimately, right? So what meiosis one does is it literally forces as much cytoplasm and proteins and mRNA and all this goodies, nutrients and stuff, into one of the cells that comes off after the division, cytokinesis 1, we could call it that, and the other one gets basically nothing. So what this division is doing is it's keeping the chromosomes divided evenly, but it's forcing all the goodies into one of the cells so the other one gets nothing. That way, this secondary oocyte that develops has as much nutrients for the developing embryo as possible. All right, we're going to neglect crossing over because there is exchange of genetic information between these chromosomes that does occur in meiosis 1. We're going to neglect that. Um, that's not technically correct, but what's going to happen is meiosis 1 is going to apportion two of these chromosomes into the polar body, which is these two in red, okay? And it's going to apportion these two other chromosomes into the secondary oocyte, okay? Now, they're haploid, and you might say, well, this was diploid up here at the top, and these are haploid down here. Why is that? They have the same number of chromosomes overall. But the, the thing you have to remember is these, this first polar body and the secondary oocyte, they only have one unique chromosome. And yes, there is crossing over, so they are a little bit different. But for the sake of argument, they're, based, they're almost the same. Almost the same. There's only one unique chromosome here. You just have the red chromosome. a eh, little bit of difference from crossing over. And over here you have just the blue chromosome. So that's why these are haploid, okay? They really just have one unique chromosome although there are slight differences. And that's what we have at the end of meiosis 1. We have our first polar body, it's haploid, it doesn't really have anything in it, no real cytoplasm, no nutrients, because all the goodies were apportioned over here to the secondary oocyte. And that's what's going to ultimately form the ovum. All right, it has all the nutrients for the developing embryo. Now, you are going to have ovulation, the secondary oocyte, and so forth. Now, What's really important to understand about the secondary oocyte is it's going to go up through metaphase 2. So it's going to be arrested again, but not in prophase 2. It's going to be arrested in metaphase 2. So what's going to happen is the secondary oocyte is going to go through prophase 2. It's going to get to metaphase 2, and so all those chromosomes, the maternal ones that is, because this is the maternal side, the maternal chromosomes are all going to be lined up at the equator, the metaphase plate, as we would say and it just halts there. And it awaits the potential of a sperm penetrating the egg, okay, or the secondary oocyte, all right? And so we're gonna assume the case where the sperm does penetrate. So we've got the secondary oocyte arrested in metaphase two, and then a sperm penetrates the secondary oocyte. And notice here, meiosis two is only completed if the sperm penetrates the egg. Now, you might ask a question, how does that make sense? Don't we have to fully get our haploid gametes and then the sperm could penetrate? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but think about it this way. We have the secondary oocyte arrested in metaphase two, so it's almost done. It's about halfway through meiosis two, but the sperm penetrates before it finishes. So here's kind of what happens. The sperm will penetrate the secondary oocyte while it's arrested in metaphase 2, and then that signals to the secondary oocyte, let's get the ball rolling and we're going to finish meiosis 2. And so when the egg detects that that sperm has penetrated, it very rapidly finishes metaphase 2, goes through anaphase 2 and telophase 2, and you get cytokinesis. And so... Again, one of these blue chromosomes is going to be apportioned into the second polar body. So we have a second polar body right here. But all the goodies are still going to be maintained by what's going to become the ovum. 
and that is the cytoplasm, the mRNAs, the proteins, all the good stuff is going to be apportioned into the ovum. And so again, the way to think about it is the sperm's penetrating the secondary oocyte during metaphase two, and that signals to the, the oocyte, let's get things moving immediately. Anaphase two gets completed, telophase two gets completed, our cytokinesis two essentially gets completed, and essentially one of those chromosomes goes to the second polar body, the other set of chromosomes gets maintained within the ovum, and notice here from the sperm we've got a little purple chromosome here, and if we combine this one set of chromosomes here, this blue one, which is in the ovum, with the sperm set of chromosomes, we're back to being diploid, and that's the process of fertilization, and we would get a zygote, which is 2N. Okay? Now, and a little analogy to help you think about how the sperm penetrates before meiosis II is completed is think about what happens when you're asleep at night and let's say, you know, there's a storm and the alarm goes off. You know, maybe your door blows open. That actually happened to me before. The wind was so powerful, the door blew open and the alarm goes off or maybe the fire alarm goes off, whatever. And you wake up and you hear that alarm and you get, you fly out of bed. It's like you weren't even asleep like you were about to go run in the Olympics. You fly out of bed. That's kind of what happens. The alarm is like the sperm penetrating the egg. And as soon as it penetrates, the alarm goes off and the secondary oocyte knows it has to finish meiosis too. And it does so very rapidly. In which case you get a polar body here, another one, which is a secondary polar body, and then you get the ovum. And now that the sperm will have donated its set of chromosomes to the set of chromosomes present in the ovum, that's fertilization. You have a diploid cell, which we would call a zygote. Okay. Now it is also worth mentioning that this other polar body here, the first one that was produced at the end of meiosis one, can in some cases undergo meiosis two as well, in which case it really just forms two more polar bodies, which I feel like is fairly intuitive to you. Okay. So we're not going into the follicle development in this video. We'll save that for a separate video. But hopefully all of this gave you a good understanding of oogenesis and how complicated it really is. And it does occur at different stages in development. We have some of it before birth, not really anything in infancy and childhood, but then puberty up through menopause is where all the action really takes place. All right, hopefully you learned something in this video. Please make sure to like and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.